started to start with a word of prayer. Would you? Oh, sure. Be kind enough to do that. Absolutely. Great. Very good. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the blessings of this day and for uh, another year of of learning about uh, the issues that uh, are constant in our city, in our community. We give you thanks uh, for the good work uh, that you instill in us, and we give you thanks for uh, ProTrade and their work to bring uh, not only the training but the dignity uh, and the power that comes with uh, work and advancement and career uh, in the midst of our economic world. We ask that you would continue to use them and those uh, in similar places to do uh, the work that you call us all to do in your name. Bless us now as we learn and listen in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Matt. Thank you, Mom. So Rashad and Thomas from Pro Trader here to share uh, uh, what their calling is uh, and they're uh, being uh, faithful to their calling in the Lord and we need a lot more of what uh, what the good work that they're doing but uh, there's hope a lot of hope for our city our newspapers and our uh, TV programs are just filled with so much um, hopelessness and there's generally somebody making a dollar or a dime out of that but um, our lived experience shows us where there is true hope and there's true hope in the work that uh, Thomas and Rashad are doing down at Pro Trade and uh, I'm excited to welcome them to St. Matthews and uh, to hear more about uh, what they do and uh, how they're honoring God with their calling in life. So if you'd welcome them, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Um, thank you for having us. My name is Rashad Washington. I'm the CEO, actually, of Pro Trade Job Development. This is our director, my good friend, also Thomas McCreary, um, who has just helped a lot in, in my desire to really just help people. At the end of the day, uh, I am a black man, and at the end of the day, I want to serve those who are in need. As you know, Wisconsin is one of the most segregated cities, one of the most segregated states. It's the number one segregated state. Number uh, Milwaukee is the number one segregated city, and I do have a big issue with that. Um, I know that all white people are not the same, and I also know that all black people are not the same. I know that uh, the city of Milwaukee is a difficult place to deal with, but I also know that that's a place if we are children of God and God called us to serve people, that is a huge area that could be served. And with the work that we do, our, our objective is to be a light and an example and be uh, of encouragement to anyone of any race to be involved and really begin to help people elevate out. We know that jobs is not the issue even though the media may say that. There's 92,000 available jobs in Wisconsin right now open. There's companies that can't even come here because we don't have the workforce. And with the workforce being 14% in the black community, uh, roughly two to three percent in the white community, I always make a joke of it to say that the, the, the white community have ran out of people that can actually work. Everyone is maxed out. And you have this large population of black and brown people uh, of what's left because 86% of the black community is working but these are the folks who've been out of work, who've been out of touch, who, who feel really low, um, and they need to be lifted because that is what we have as a workforce uh, as of now. And um, our job has really been to just uplift the people because my story is I took that same walk. I was in the streets, I was a drug dealer, I was a womanizer, um, you know, everything you can think of or what the, what the media may say, I definitely was that individual. But through God, I made it through. I now am, have been married for 12 years. I have four beautiful kids. I own my own home. I own several companies. I own, um, you know, I, 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 and I'm giving back. You know, I'm not just, I didn't just lift myself and then remove myself from the problem because I know at one point in time, I personally was a part of the problem. And I know that a lot had to do with not having those examples growing up, to be very honest. Um, I always say um, that the difference is in the inner city, you don't get to see a lot of entrepreneurs. You don't get to see a lot of successful people. You don't get to see a lot of stable homes. And that does affect one's mentality. And if, and if the folks who you're sitting on the porch with don't have hope either, then that's the only thing that I'm getting. So to some degree you ask, well, should a person be criminalized so much for their ignorance? You know, and for us, it's like, you know what? 
let's give the folks, let's inform the folks, let's show the people uh, that everyone is in the same. So it's a blessing when we have people like Connor Williams come through the doors to be able to inform people, uh, to help them take that next step on their road to success. Um, we have two videos that I wanted to show you all, <coughs> a, a video and a presentation. So last year, uh, we were awarded um, the Wisconsin Job Honors Award, and this has helped uh, our two organizations. Our, our staffing partner is not here, but you will see um, part of what we do in our why. Milwaukee is one of the segregated cities. The unemployment rate been roughly 18% for a very long time in the black community. When it was 18% in the black community, it was 5% in the white community. So the average white kid that come out, they say, I could be a doctor, I could be a lawyer. Now for me, when I come out, I see I can be a cleaner. Or if I wanna have the nice things, I would have to be a drug dealer. You can't be what you don't see. And if a person doesn't see value in themselves, then the, uh, the ability to aspire to do more just will never be there. So for us, the biggest thing we can do is to show people how valuable they truly are. A trade makes a person an asset to the world. The reality of the situation is you have an industry that, had, that demands a lot of workers. You have a lot of people with no work. Oh, it's funny because we grew up in the same hood, as we would say. We ran into each other. Um, years and years later, and he said, hey, I got an idea. You're here to help the people, I'm here to help the people. We can either become competitors or uh, we can compete more or less against the world. So it's just us against the world at this point. Mm -hmm. In construction in particular, it's just a, a really unique pathway that has to be taken if you don't come from a family of trades. Getting in construction isn't like walking into Walmart and filling out an application. Pro Trade focuses on education, personal development, Mindful focuses on um, scalability and career development. We decided that we're better together. Uh, with our 10-week course, you can only miss two days. There is no such thing as being late. Our gate closes at 7.30. Mindful staffing then puts them on a four-week stress test to really see if they can handle the construction trades, if they can handle the tough talk, if they can handle the tough work. I want to create something that takes the ego out of construction. And I want to bring the focus back to the art, the craft, and the beauty of being a true tradesman who's in love with their craft. There's not a day that goes by that me and Reggie aren't talking about what we're doing, how we can improve it, what the future looks like, the people we need. A lot of times you don't get a job just because you don't talk right. And it's not taken into consideration that the environment is what shaped them to talk like this. So it doesn't mean that they're wrong or they're bad just because they talk this way. You know, these are people with hearts that really want to change but have no idea of how to. And no one is going into the community saying, come with me. I've been in Cosway for basically five years. I got out on August 20, August 24, 2015. They showed me things that I, I necessarily didn't get from my family. I am getting straight from a stranger. They saw some in me that I didn't see in myself. The goal is to make it cool. Make it cool to be a tradesman who has a successful career and a happy family. Make that cool instead of making it cool to be the guy who goes to the club and parties and being on Monday does nothing. I'm, I'm not a lazy person. It, I love to go to work. You know, I love to pull on my tool belt. I love to come home dirty. I had, had to become a felon to understand that. You know, so I went through them trials and tribulations and here today I stand now with a better man, a better brother, a better uncle, a better friend. It goes back to why I love the trades because the trades is most forgiving. The trades don't care about your past, they worry about what are you going to do today on the job. For the felon, it's an opportunity and it's a grand opportunity. And I heard Rashad speak and so afterwards, the next few days, I went and saw the facility. I was very, very impressed with just their vision and the idea of giving people that second chance. He's opened my eyes to a world that I was not familiar with and he's given me a window into that world that I'm just so <clears throat> grateful for. But at the end of the day, Every single person is responsible for their own life. That is the privilege of being a human, that no one's going to save you. And until you can start making better decisions for you, until you can envision your future, until you can be ready to learn, no teacher is relevant. We want to reduce uh, incarceration rates. We want to reduce 
uh, the unemployment rates. You know, we want more fathers to be involved. We want uh, people to start buying all of these foreclosed homes. I know that I'm doing what God sent me here to do. You can be exceedingly successful in the service to other people. It just takes a little bit of sacrifice and a little bit of hope, and, and you have changed. This is Connor's computer. <laughs> Apple stuff. Close that out. So you know, before we even go into uh, go into the PowerPoint, uh, would anyone would anyone like to share uh, their perspective of just what's been said so far, or or seeing the video of anything? Kind of your thoughts or confirming of of what you see, what's going on, or anything like that? Well, I'd like, it, it was, one of the statements made was that um, most tradespeople come from households of trades, uh -huh. tradesmen. So there's that pattern that's set. And that's, it, to break into it as a newbie is, is very, very difficult. Uh -huh. So I can appreciate yeah. what you're offering. Yeah, and um, I myself, you know, I got into the trades uh, from a very unorthodox way. Um, my story is is that my mother and father divorced when I was roughly about three years old. Uh, my father um, was not really involved in my life. I seen him maybe two or three times a year. Um, my mother, being a single parent mother, she worked third shift. Um, I dropped out of high school at about 10th grade. Um, by 10th grade, I was smoking weed, having sex. I was not going to school. I had a 0 0.8 GPA, dropped out of high school. By 19, I was on my way to prison for domestic violence, uh, to jail for domestic violence. That was my first offense. Um, and that's when I just began to see things a lot differently. When I went to prison, it was a very, very, very unique um, experience. Um, when I went in there, the, the, the probation officer, the, the, the sheriff, she seemed to know me. That was the first thing. I'm like, okay, yeah, that, I'm cool. I was young. I'm like, yeah, you probably see me at clubs or something. So then when I get in there, I start seeing people I know. And from there, when I went upstairs to the pie where I put on my orange suit, I seen more people I know. And in my mind, I think that I really do believe God has given me this gift to learn quickly from a lot of mistakes. So I evolved a lot very fast in my life. And I said, you know what? I see how this is a trap for black men because it's so comfortable to go to prison. You know, if you know everyone and you're good on, on your foods and all this type of stuff, then it is not such a bad thing. And at the same time, on the flip side, if you're out on the other side and there's no job opportunities, or you think that, or you or you you're held down even sometimes by your probation officer, where uh, there's employers that won't hire folks just because they have probation officers, and probation officers will set your meeting at 10 a.m. Yeah. when you have to be at work, and your employer don't have time for that. Production has to be done, so they say, you know what? I'd rather not deal with that headache, not necessarily you. And I, I just seen how this thing was just set up so flawlessly for folks to just consistently revolve and I made a promise to myself that I will not be viewed as just another number from a probation officer or a judge or anyone else and in result of that I just really began to change my life and change my association and it's very difficult when you have uh, 10 year old friends that you have to completely disassociate yourself from because you're trying to take this new walk and you know that you're still weak and your flesh is weak, so you can't go around him. And it was a really tough decision, but it was one of the best decisions I made in my life. But as I've grown, I realized that regardless of your circumstance and regardless of what's around you, you actually still can grow. At the time, I was not there. So, so this is, um, these are some of the partners and organizations that we work with. We work with Milwaukee Public Schools, PDCA, and uh, we, we uh, get some consultation from Manpower and 
you know, Sherman Williams donates us stuff, the Milwaukee Bucks supports what we're doing, and MMAC, as well as other organizations. So who am I? Here's a little insight on Facebook, right? Everyone uh, that's on Facebook kind of <laughs> run this test to see what, what it says about you. It says you are an honest individual. Uh, you believe in kindness, but don't shy away from voicing your opinion when necessary. You always choose the harsh truth over a com comforting lie. You take a stand for what is morally right, and that is why people respect you a lot. You are a loyal friend and a true human being. You care like a mother, support like a father, and fight like a lover. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote and, that? Uh, right. And uh, Thomas have known me for roughly 10 years now. And what would you say, Thomas? You're, he's like being in the middle of a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> That's a working relationship. So I'll, I'll speak just really quick. Yeah, so but absolutely. I'd like to first say I'm Thomas McCray, the director. And <clears throat> Some of you are my, most of you, well, some of you are my neighbors. I see you at uh, Ace, I see you at Pick and Save. I live on 68th and North. My family's been there uh, for over 20 years. My wife and I have raised uh, five kids in this community. Three went to graduate from Tulsa East, one from Pius, um, one's grandson graduated from Tulsa East. Um, so I'll give you a tidbit. So you guys know what Bel Air Cantina is, right? Everybody knows that, right, on 68th? Okay, the great house that sits right next door to the butts them, that's our house, that's what I do, so. I rode my bike over today. Um, so, so what I want to say though is that um, my story is a little bit different. It's, it's way back as a, I've aged myself now, right? But uh, so I was telling Pastor this morning. So my brother, my oldest brother Micah, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. He just became the first African American president of the New Brunswick Theological Seminary in New Jersey. Uh, my father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. My great grandfather was a pastor. Um, my brother always tells me, are you still looking over your shoulder? And I go, yeah, kind of, sort of, but I think that my call has been the people. That's, I truly know that that's what it is, and I get emotional because I love everybody. If anybody who knows me knows that I don't step over anybody. I don't care who you are, what you are, what you look like. I love people, and I want to see people always be their best, absolutely. And so... Um, <clears throat> Coming to Pro-Trade was interesting because, like you said, we met about 10 years ago, and uh, we met at the barbershop, and this guy would come in, he was this, you know, 20-something-year-old guy, always on his toes, just kind of coming in the shop, just love, you know, I sit there, and I sit, and we talk, and we have these conversations, deep conversations about the people and what we saw that was wrong, we just, these conversations, and I would go home and say to my wife, man, I know, I met this young guy, I said, he is just, he's an amazing young man. You know, and we continue on. This went on for a few years, and about five years ago, almost six now, mm -hmm. he said to me, um, when, when I need you, I want you to come work with me, and when I need you, will you come? And I said to him, and that was six years ago, I said, I don't care what I'm doing, when you call me, I'll come. And last year, he called me, and I was at Northwestern Mutual. I had been running a very good practice as a financial advisor, and uh, he said, I need you. So I need two months to shut down my practice and transfer my clients to my colleagues and whatnot. And it took me a month and a half. I was so excited because this is where I really wanted to be. And you know, we, we do amazing work. We love hard. You know, we want to see the communities that we all are in together. And we really are in these communities together uh, become better. And they can. They really can become better communities. So with that said, I'm going to sit back down. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Um, one of the things I always say is secretly what we are trying to do is, is get the white and black culture really together to, to really trust because that's the conversation that we're not having all over the state. And, and the thing is, is that we are the solution to one another. There's business owners that have business issues, but transportation, you know, it's politics in between all of this. and. You know, sometimes we rely on that too much instead of just doing what's in our heart or just doing what's right, whatever that may be. Um, transportation, as you know, is a huge barrier that we face for employment. I personally believe that the churches, all churches, uh, for the older people that's like not working, it's a great opportunity to reach out to someone and say, you know what, I'll serve right now to help this brother get back and forth to work and 
okay, yeah, he may have to pay me out of his pocket, but that's an opportunity to minister. That's an opportunity to share. And that's more, uh, that's more of an opportunity also to learn about another person, you know, because a lot of times when you have these conversations, you realize that we're more alike than different, you know. And um, sometimes I'm afraid to have a conversation with people, and I can understand that, but we have to push past our fears. And I think that uh, the only reason that we have fear is because due to a lack of understanding. So, um, so I'm gonna give you guys a tour of our facility because um, my I have a 15 year old daughter that was born with special needs. My daughter was born stillborn. Her name is Aaliyah Washington. She's my angel. That's the very reason why I changed my life because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to be like my father. That was my motivation, motivating factor. So um, I learned about the brain because she was born with brain damage. And what I learned when I went to uh, Philadelphia is that there's certain things that triggers the brain for memory. There are certain things uh, that triggers the brain for one to be calming um, and so on and so forth. And also I own a residential painting company so you know that colors matter and they're set moods and tones. So our training space is directly in the heart uh, of the ghetto on 30th and Burleigh, the 30th Street. Uh, industrial area so that's our space and our mission is to help people and revitalize the world uh, we absolutely do believe at this point what's lacking is love at the end of the day you know for me when it's when the Bible says love your neighbor I know what that means and I live by it I was just telling my cousin yesterday you know some people at church they read the Bible but I really believe it you know, <laughs> and, and that's where I felt different. It's like, you know, God healed my son. On another note, aside from this, I have a seven-year-old son, Ramon Washington. He had over 175 different food intolerances. Oh, Ten of them were anaphylactic. You know, seven of them were airborne. And if anything were to happen, my wife... Um, my wife would wake up in dread for him to say he was hungry because his body would mutate and today he can eat watermelon and tomorrow he'll be breaking out in hives from eating watermelon. I mean, he couldn't eat strawberries, oranges, um, you name it, he really couldn't have. And he, um, he, he, it started when he was about one years old after he got his uh, shot. And my wife, we lived through that for roughly seven years, but I was an entrepreneur, so I'm out working all the time, and my wife lived this. And um, roughly about a year before then, I had wrote, because I do believe in the power of words, the power of thoughts. Um, God said that greater works shall you perform, and if you speak, right, you tell this mountain to move, it will move. And I, once again, I really believe this. So... That's what I believed, and we wrote out, and I told my son, name everything you want to eat. And we wrote all these things on this piece of paper, and through our personal development training, you know, smart goals, so you set a date, and so on and so forth, and we gave it a year. And I, I, I stand before you a year later, God healed him. My wife prayed and fasted, and she said, I want you to read this book, and she said, uh, I want you to fast for your business. And my thought was, why would I fast for my business when my kids need healing? So I fast, I, I just, we decided that once a week we were gonna fast and pray together. We fast and prayed on a Monday in prayer. God told her that our son is healed. So the next day we took down all of our peanut allergy signs and all that type of stuff. And we began to feed him. And she would just pray and ask God what he want her to feed my son and she went on a 40-day fast as she was feeding him. She was denying herself. And his body was responding positively versus anaphylactically. And <coughs> to this day, he's just, he's our miracle child. Mm -hmm. You know, so the power of thought, the power of words and faith in God, I, I, I know that all things are possible, but it, but it doesn't seem that we're exercising it as much as we should. Because the church is, I mean, you know, it... It's a paradox. Sunday is the most segregated day, but it's a day of serving God. It just does not align. So for me, just service to others, balance it all out, right? It's like you get the word, but then you go apply it 
to all of those, all of the folks out these, you know, outside of these doors. So our job, once again, is to help people and revitalize the world. So when you come into our doors, you will go up these stairs and you see that little white sign. This is the first thing that folks that's interested in our training program uh, see. It says, uh, it didn't show. Oh, it might be a, a glitch with the, the apple. Sometimes the oh, PowerPoint doesn't go exactly correct. That is totally fine. Sorry. Sorry. What it says is, um, yeah, now you know what it looked like. It's coming up. But it says, within the freedom to choose are those endowments that make us uniquely human. In addition to self-awareness, we have imagination, the ability to create in our minds beyond our present reality. So when they come upstairs, it says you have now entered the no excuse zone. And our objective is seriously, I mean, because we all know people that come up with excuses of why things are getting done. And we need folks to begin to do things and become more involved in the economy, in the community, in their kids' life, so that we can begin to dismantle the cycle of poverty, the cycle of fatherless kids, the cycle, you know, because a lot of that stemmed from I didn't have a father, so the relationship I got into, you know, when we began to have sex, that resulted in the kid. But if, if, if I had that example, I would have knew, don't even go there yet, right? I wasn't told that. So we need to begin to break those cycles. So for me, I live my life as an example. That's why I'm married and I'm making sure I work through my marriage and I'm making sure that you know, I began to change, uh, change things differently. Uh, generational uh, poverty will not be something that will happen in my house. I bought a life insurance policy, you know, and I'm making sure that my kids have college funds and I'm making, you know, all of those things. And we need to be, be you know, for me as a black man is to create more of those type of examples in the black community. So we have a five week, five week or a 10 week commitment um, our five-week training program is for our painting. Our 10-week uh, course is for our construction. It just jumped. So <clears throat> these signatures that you see on the wall, if you guys were to ever come into our facility, our doors is always open. Um, these are individuals who's actually, who actually graduated the program. And what this is about is these folks leaving words of encouragement for folks that come behind them. You see what one person wrote, if you don't know where you are headed, any road will get you there. Uh, choices. Another person wrote, stay committed and focused just because something doesn't happen the way you want it to doesn't uh, mean God has failed you. It only means he's planning something better for you. <laughs> so intentional design. Everything that we do out of our space is very intentional. Every single thing. <coughs> And this is our hallway leading up. Once you go through the stairs, you will notice there's uh, welcoming colors. You know, everything is very intact. Um, pictures, there's inspiring pictures. One says the secret to success is try. Talks about happiness, be kind, smile. Um, Muhammad Ali fighting under the water. Um, Babe Ruth, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. Because once again, and the reason why I say it is, for most folks, they're used to failing than succeeding. You know, and the closest you can get to success is getting money, right? For, for most folks, it just depends on where your level of thinking is. So we want them to first get into the mindset of just not giving up and believing in yourself. This one is one of my favorite. Your story matters, share it with the world. And then another way, and, and when you go through these doors, um, it leads into our personal development room. So, this is our personal development room, and what you see on the walls are actually, um, that's one of our exercises that we do day one. And basically what it is is a description of who am I? Because most folks will come into social programs and say, I'm unemployed, I need a job. No, who are you as an individual? Are you a father? Are you a husband? Are you your son? You know, not... Well, I'm a convicted felon. I'm just trying to get my life right. No, that's a title. Um, but really, who are you as an individual? And, and we, we charge our people to really begin to look deep within themselves, to find their own self-worth versus us giving it to them. Um, we go through a, a ton of various different assessments for our folks to really look at themselves. More importantly, 
Um, so they go through a barrier assessment to figure out what's really holding them back, whether it's education, transportation, housing, <coughs> relationship issues, and things like that. We go through an exercise of uh, understanding what a core value is, whether good or bad, and what core values one would need in order to succeed in the future related to, once again, family, spirituality, health, business, work, lifestyle. Uh, we go through an array of life assessments on those same topics. Um, habit assessments. The habit assessment um, is really good because what we do is we show individuals how to really take a look at the time that they have. Within one year, the average person sleeps three months out of the year. So now you have not, you know, when you take the actual time and you condense it, it, it equals roughly three months. So then we get them to see, okay, now you have nine months left. Now let's look at what are you doing with your time? Are you on social media all the time? Are you watching the news all the time? And are you doing things that's really not helping you to reach your goal? And then they get to see, okay, once you take that away, now realistically the real raw time you have is three months. And how can anyone reach this large lofty goal in three months, right? So we get them to see that they need to reconstruct their time. And every assessment uh, <laughs> results in an action plan. So we always try to move our people to action. So then you'll go through the hall, through the red. The red sign is our exit. And then this is our, our office space behind our personal development office. So these are some of our offices. This is our partner, Regina Reed of Mindful Staff. And so we now have a staffing agency inside of our training facility. One of the individuals that was employed. And this is, uh, we have a community room, which we now partner with a nonprofit close to us. But we used to get donations of clothes for individuals to be able to go to events, church, or whatever it may be, and they can dress up nice with khakis and buttons ups and things like that. And that's another one of our conference rooms. So then we'll go down the stairs. Once again, about intentional design. Um, this is our wall of encouragement. Every single picture on this wall right here has nothing but encouraging words because it's really about setting an environment that's comfortable for an individual to learn. And so that they understand we're not there just to make money, but we are wholeheartedly serious about helping. Um, and there's quotes all over the walls. Like this one says, nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. <laughs> These are some of our students in class. When the world says, give up, hope whispers, try it one more time. I can accept failure. I can't accept not trying, Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. So these are things that they just consistently see every single day. Once again, we're changing the mindset because it's not just as simple as saying, here's a job, don't commit crime anymore. It's not, it's so many barriers. Every single class, there's some type of trauma which Connor is helping us with now. Um, there's some type of trauma that happens. Homelessness, day one, Connor came for orientation. And we said this in the meeting before, Connor, every graduate, every class, someone close, unfortunately, um, not one of our students, but within their immediate family, Someone gets murdered. Someone goes homeless. Every single class, it don't matter if it's three people or 15 people, and it's sad. And Connor came on day one, at, given an orientation and an individual was dealing with that right away. And Connor jumped right in and said, you know what, let me start making calls, and he didn't have to. So we have six modules for our general construction course, and what we do, from our, our general construction course, once again, as you were saying, it's, it, it's so difficult to get into the trades if you haven't grew up around that. So what we do is we basically <coughs> attract people to us through job opportunities. And then we, we uh, inundate them with all of this personal development that they didn't see coming because they only came to get a certification <laughs> to get a job. But we, we, we focus on changing the mind because our philosophy is it's not what happens on the job that gets you fired. It's typically what problems you bring to work <coughs> that get you fired. So um, our curriculums are all nationally recognized, allowing an individual <coughs> to uh, receive a certification in the state of Wisconsin, but then also be able to travel to other states and get connected with other employment agencies and organizations. 
So we go through safety, construction map, intro to hand tools, intro to power tools, intro to construction drawings, uh, intro to material handling as well. So once again, that's our encouraging wall, and that's just Thomas showing pictures of the uh, who am I, because our students draw it out. And you will see different things. I'm dedicated, creative, uh, resourceful, responsible. I'm a leader, I'm helpful, and, and things like that, because we want our folks to know their self-worth. I'm sorry, I mean, oh, no, no. can you talk about the, the we will and we will not? How that yes. So. We're teaching uh, our folks to learn how to work together as a team from day one. You know, you, you have some folks, uh, like I have a white friend who didn't see black people until they was 19, so she was 19. She lived far up north. And then, you know, you have some black folks that's in the city where they never go out of the city. They're confined to blocks. And that's a real reality. So we get them to understand, look, in construction, it's going to be an array of cultures and you have to know how to work together with one another in the conversation. So we, we get them in the spirit of team building, you know, uh, from the beginning. And the we will and we will not board is something they agree together as a team, right? Because they each came in there with individual goals and now they're working together as a team. So they come up with the we will be respectful, we will work hard, we will show up on time and things like that. And now they're able to hold each other accountable instead of us having to police them so much. And they also create a we will not board, which will, you know, we will not show up late, we will not smoke weed, you know, we will not uh, interrupt another individual. So all of these uh, skills that need to be taught they know it, right? But they just have to tap into an environment that can cultivate that. That's the issue. So uh, so this is one of our training facilities. That's our simulation room for our residential painting uh, course. So you can see there's doors, windows, shutters, siding, crown moldings, you know, all the historical homes in Tulsa, I'm sure have a lot of crown moldings and things like that. Um, and these are all the various different skill sets that they learn. So the circles that you see is a real practice of how you learn how to maneuver that brush and things like that. So we're teaching them, once again, the basic fundamentals of, the, of residential painting in this instance. Uh, the other would be, you know, uh, the basic fundamentals of general construction. So that are you interested in learning more? If they say yes, we then get them connected with it, our employer partner. So they learn things like task sequencing, you know, how you set up a project, set up and clean up of a project, uh, painting and caulk, patching and caulking, cutting and rolling, basic fundamentals. Then we have our shop. Um, so you will go around this corner and then turn left. So this is actually our shop room. And then here is where they take what they've learned in the classroom that you've seen in the beginning, and they begin to apply those skills in this classroom. They have rubrics that they work through, so we are able to assess each person's individual skill set. Um, and this is what we actually used to work on, small projects. We uh, Now we're working on building blessing boxes. And the blessing boxes is really cool. It's just like the little library that you guys see in front of homes, if some of you even may have some. Um, the blessing box is created for the inner city to create these small um, blessings, basically. At the end of the day, non-perishable food items will go into these boxes. Mm -hmm. And the whole objective is to get the community itself involved, the churches, the store owners, and the neighbors, all involved to begin to donate and put into these boxes so that if you ever have someone struggling and they can't make it to the store, they may be able to go to that box and grab something out to feed their family. So just these are some of the small pieces. Some of the things that they learn in here is hands-on training, uh, long periods of standing they go through. You have the rubrics, uh, and they do all of this for no pay, ten for ten weeks. And to me, that says a lot. If a person is committing themselves at no pay to better their future, they should be given an opportunity, and an employer should be able to work with whatever other barriers they have, because it's like you can't. Connor knows this, he's been doing this for years, I've been doing this for years, Tom has been doing this for years. You can't fix it all at once. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's what we have to begin to realize. So um, we have a pilot program <coughs> called Wheels For Real, 
and what we're looking for is to purchase or get donated vehicles, hoopties, as we would call them. You know, beaters with a heater that can get you from A to B. You can get that nice car when you work your own job and you save your own money, but for now we understand that transportation <coughs> is one of our uh, large barriers. Most of the agencies that we work with that say they have 3,000, 4,000 people on their caseloads, most of them will say 5% of my people, 10% of my people have a driver's license or a VL. And that's terrible. And it's like, how are we going to knock this down? So what we've done is we we are a for-profit entity, but, and the reason why that I didn't want the red tape and to be controlled of how my program should run. So we take the profits from our own funds and we buy used vehicles and we try to help people out. But our but we don't do that all the time. We're not able to do it as often as we would like, but uh, we definitely do do that and that's what we're trying to grow in. So this vehicle that I'm proud of, we got for $1,200 and this would be a blessing to someone that could get this vehicle. Now they have transportation to work as they have their valid driver's license and insurance and they will be able to make a small payment of $200 a month as they're getting paid to pay off this vehicle. But now we're helping them to stabilize their life because it's hard to focus on uh, it's hard to focus on anything when food is an issue, housing is an issue, and transportation is an issue. Exactly. So, um, that's <coughs> it. So, um, and this is, I love this quote, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And, and that's one of the things that we do. We just always talk with our, our students to help them to understand that your, your thoughts is very powerful. And you have to understand that you create your own reality because every I can look back honestly and say the things that I said I would not do and the things that I said I would do and the things that I said I would obtain I have done and it definitely does start with the thought and I believe that if God if if Christ's spirit dwells within us as the spirit has the ability to do all things and the spirit dwells within us we have the ability to do all things and if we don't believe that, then we have to question ourselves to say, do we really believe what the word of God says? You know, so I, I stand by it, I live by it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we have a few more minutes. So uh, we'll finish up at uh, 10 2. So are there any questions or observations for Rashad and Thomas? Or? Oh, gee. <laughs> Herb, we'll start with you, Herb, and then yes. John. Do you prep them for the entrance exam for apprentices, be it plumber, electrician, steam fitter, carpenter, no, cement mason? Unfortunately, we, we don't. We do te teach the general construction math and the basic blueprint, blueprint reading, but we don't prep them. We have a partner. We work with, we're working with WRTP Big Step, Big Step. Yeah. Um, and we also are working more and more with MATC for that preparation. And my second thought is, what's your thought about the Milwaukee school system abolishing the old boys tech and saying, I, I remember the quote, the new principal saying, the future's in computers, not this stuff. I think that that was a bad decision back and then. And they never it's replaced a, any of the we're seeing the results now because both industries are growing. And as uh, my partner would say is, Every, every, everything that's growing, every other industry that's growing starts first with construction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The buildings have to be built, right? But they took that out, which was a mistake because now there's this huge gap in skilled trades. So uh, hospitals probably can't even scale at the speed that they want to, right? Because, because of that decision. And I think that... I heard an interesting talk the other day that said artificial intelligence will replace the person at the keyboard but they still have to come up with a robot that can wire a house. <laughs> oh, they never will. So, I mean, you got prefab, but I don't think that every company is going to go that direction. You do have prefab, but even in the prefab, there's actual just people in warehouses that's wiring the house, you know, so, so yeah. And that's why I do love the trades, because that's something that will never go away. One of the things I noticed, there's a couple of things uh, one was when I first came in, and I didn't catch your names because we were, we were making sandwiches for the repairs of the breach downstairs. Okay. I forgot. So uh, I came in a little bit late. But one of the things I noticed was the sign, the no excuse zone. Mm -hmm. 
and it's reminded me, and I, you know who Julius Irving was. Yes. yes. He would go, when he was playing for the 76ers, he would go into the schools and talk to young men. And he had one a young man who said that he played basketball, but his team lost because this happened, that happened, and that mm -hmm. happened. And Julius Irving said, lose, don't excuse. Mm -hmm. He said, that team was better than your team. He said, that doesn't mean that you should stop trying the, doing the best you can. Because if you do the best you can in school or on a team, you don't have to make any excuses whatsoever. Correct. And I, I appreciate people, uh, athletes, who go in and mentor people. And I appreciate, uh, his, his name is Green, I'm not sure who he was. He was in Houston looking for boats and he was personally now this is a man who makes a lot of money playing professional basketball, personally rescuing people from their roofs. Nice. And God bless him, I think that was uh, an outstanding role model. And the other thing was when you talked about understanding between uh, uh, racial divisions, mm -hmm. we also uh, serve lunches at Cross Church and, and I have a good friend there, his name is Easter. And um, I met him first at our one of our uh, men's retreats mm -hmm. and I started telling them a few little jokes they were clean jokes of course but <laughs> he, he, I would get them laughing and we became friendly uh, this past uh, time that I went down there he was upset and he came over to me and he, we do the man hug mm -hmm. and he said to me he said I had some folks that said they hate white people and he says I'm very upset about that he said because they don't know that there are some people who are nasty he said, but there are some people who are very good. He said, like you people who come down, mm -hmm. bring food and treat us with respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. He said, I tried to tell them that. He said, but some people just don't listen. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm appreciative of a person like uh, Easter. And he told me, he said he had a very troubled youth. Mm -hmm. He said, but when he found Christ, he said it changed his life. And he is a hard worker and... Um, works with people at Cross Church, and he's always there, and he always looks, he always said, I'm, I always look for you, he said, because you always have something to say. Like I told him when it's 60th birthday, three things happen. The first thing that goes is the memory, and I told him, I'll be darned if I can remember what the other two were. <laughs> and he laughed, he said, I gotta tell my friends that. Thank that you, was John. his 60th birthday. I appreciate that. So I wanna be respectful of time. Uh, a few things, um, uh, one is, I hope this is the start of a uh, relationship uh, between the people of St. Matthews and, uh, and Pro Trade. Um, and at some stage, this is the first uh, Sunday of uh, Sunday School starting in Adult Ed, and uh, we haven't quite got into the swing of things. So next time, I'd, I, uh, I might be hopeful that even more people would be here. Um, a second observation, a short one, is you're talking about different cultures. And um, there's something, and I think it's what you encountered, uh, Thomas, in the, um, in the barber shop, is there's something compelling about the culture of God. Uh, we read in the Bible about the kingdom of God, but most of us don't live in kingdoms any longer. It's the culture of God, and there's something compelling about it. And there's something very compelling about the work that you're doing down in uh, Pro Trade, and I, I, have a, I have a deep conviction that, uh, that it, will lead us to a better place. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's characterized by the, the culture or kingdom of God. And I, I, um, Pastor Mick Rochke down at Reformation had that beautiful phrase for all those years that we're all blessed and broken. And um, there's obvious brokenness that you shared with us from your life, Rashad. Uh, and um, there's one of the problems that we have as a community uh, is uh, there's a lot of hiding of brokenness in, uh, in the white culture. That's my experience. And uh, when, we're in, when we're in authentic community with each other, the sharing of, uh, of brokenness by some of our brothers and sisters in the inner city allows us white, allow, have allowed me mm -hmm. to um, uh, embrace and acknowledge and uh, um, struggle with my own brokenness and it's very helpful because it puts things in perspective for me but can i share that you know and, and i and i appreciate what you said i have a very diverse background my my daughter my oldest daughter's mother is white 
my wife is Puerto Rican, and and I, you know, as a as a kid in like fourth grade, I wanted a girlfriend from every nationality. For some <laughs> <laughs> but to to the point of the brokenness and the and, you know secret brokenness, I've learned that that is in every culture. And I never thought that. I never knew that mm -hmm. until, you know, I used to go to Milwaukee Church of Christ and a sister would get up and talk if she was white and she would talk about how her father, her father would abuse her or there were white brothers <laughs> that would share that their fathers weren't in their lives. But on the flip side, when you're in the, in the black community, you think that every white kid has a father <coughs> and mother present, you know. And in the Hispanic community, you, you, you didn't know that, let's say, molestation you know, was, was rampant and it wasn't talked about, but that's the same thing in the black community as well. So to my point is, once again, we have a lot more in common than we really know. And we enrich each other by being in community Absolutely. with each other. Yes. We need, need to diminish, we need diminished lives by being uh, subject to the fears that the world promulgates. Um, so I hope this is, not, I hope that, Feel free that you'll come back Absolutely. Yeah, a, another Us. time. Yeah. Um, you had some, I'm not sure if it's appropriate time for the specific asks that you had, but... Um, oh, no. Um, I think that let's just let it happen naturally. Uh, amen. Yeah. And Wait, so, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Let it happen naturally. Yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. So I always like to uh, close in a word of prayer, and given oh. your, your lineage, oh. Thomas, I want to accuse you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Your grandfather and your brother. And, well, that would be great. Heavenly Father. Thank you for allowing me to rise this morning, allowing us all to rise this morning, Father. You put me on that bike this morning, you brought me down 45 minutes early, Father. To be the pastor this morning, talk about uh, love and neighborly and, and, and the kindness that we all need to have together, Father. And I was blessed by this service. And I just want to continue and, and just ask you that you continue to bless us as we go forward today with our families and, and, and just share the love that we, we all have with our families and, and with each other in the community, Father, that we can, we can see a kind face and, and, and share love with each other, Father, and that we continue to uh, have this discussion and just that it goes further, Father, and that um, we just continue to make this world a better place. Uh, I want you to pray, I want to pray for the people in, in Florida, Father, because that's some type of devastation that's happening down there as well. And, you know, just continue to, to strengthen us strengthen our resolve and strengthen our faith, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So okay. we're going to show our appreciation for coming. Yeah.